Good morning, you guys. Everybody good this morning? Yeah? Everybody had their cup of coffee? Or had their cup of coffee spilled on them this morning? Right, Donnie? It happens. It happens. I did it two weeks ago, so not to throw Donnie under the bus. We've all, we've all been there, right? Um, well, it's good to see you guys this morning. We, um, for the summer, have been um, walking through the Psalms, um, just this collection of worship songs to God, right? And um, as we've talked about, um, King David has written a majority of these, even though there are several other authors who have uh, written the Psalms. Uh, But today, we're going to be talking about Psalms of Confidence. Psalms of Confidence, right? If you've ever been in that moment in life, right, where it just seems like everything around you is crashing in, maybe you're there right now now in this moment. Maybe, maybe that's been your week this week. Or maybe you can think back to a time where it just seemed like everything was out of control and there was nothing that you could do to make it better. What do we do in those moments? And it's out of potentially a moment like that that King David writes the 23rd Psalm. I would, I would submit to you this morning that Psalm 23 is the most familiar of all 150 of the Psalms. Maybe it's the most popular or well-known chapter in the entire Bible. There is something about the way that David frames these words that has connected with people for generation after generation. And my hope is that today it's going to connect with you. Um, There is so much information out there. There's been so many commentaries and thoughts written about the 23rd Psalm. I was talking with Ross this week, and as we were just kind of walking through the text to Psalm 23, even though it's only six verses, we literally came to the place where there was so much information that we cannot cover this in just one week. We don't feel like we could do it justice. Um, And so this is going to be a two-part series. So today we're only going to talk about the first three verses because, again, they're just so rich and so deep. But I think what we will find is that there is a confidence that we can have in our faith, a confidence that that doesn't lie just within us, but actually relies and lies within who God is. As I was studying uh, this past week uh, for this message, um, I was reading a book, and I don't know if you ever had one of those moments where you read a line in a book, maybe a sentence or a thought in a book, and you kind of read through it, and you move on to the next thing, and then later on you just start thinking about that line, just kind of comes back to your memory. That's what happened to me this week. I was, I was reading a commentary on Psalm 23, and, and there, was a, there was a sentence in there, a line in there, and I kind of read over it, and I was like, okay, that's cool, and moved on. And then I just started, it just kept coming up over and over again in my mind. It was, and the line was this, everyone needs a shepherd. I'll just let you sit with that for just a second. Everyone needs a shepherd. See, if you're familiar with Psalm 23, Chloe just read for us, right? It begins by saying, the Lord is my shepherd. And I wonder this morning, as we find ourselves in 2023, living in a world where most of us, at the very least, would say we walk around with a low-grade level of anxiety every single day, where it seems like the worries and the cares of life are just more than we can handle, We feel like life is just at times overwhelming to the point where we just can't handle it anymore. And you know, at the same time, we also try to combat that idea by thinking, there's just something I need to do more to fix it. Maybe if I was just something somehow different, then this situation wouldn't be what it is. But what if the answer doesn't come through something, uh, what if the answer doesn't come through knowing something more or doing something more or being something more? But what if the answer to our worries and our anxiety comes through the process of admitting that we need a shepherd? Coming to the problems of life, not thinking that we have to figure out all the problems, but just coming to it and admitting that, you know what, we do have problems. And there's things in life that are just too heavy for us to carry on our own. And maybe, just maybe, we need a shepherd. 
You see, I think that is where David writes Psalm 23 out of that place, out of that place of desperation. You see, sometimes life, life can, can move us in such a place that we have no response except to admit that we don't have it all figured out. You ever been there? Has your circumstances and situations in life ever got you to a place where you had to just admit, you know what, I can't figure this out on my own anymore. And I think that's where David comes to Psalm 23, and he writes, the Lord is my shepherd. You see, this, this mindset that we walk around with that I have to figure it all out. It's all on me to figure out all the problems of life. There's some good news this morning. I don't think it's all just because, because we're prideful people. That's true. We are. We do struggle in that way. But we also live in a self-reliant culture, don't we? We live in a world that says that it's, all, that it's all about you and that you can figure out all your problems. Just pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Never let them see you bleed. We say phrases like that, which gives the idea that we can just figure out all of these issues on our own. But again, what if it's not about being or doing, but it's about admitting that we are needy people? Psalm 40 verse 17 says this, in this desperate cry, it says, As for me, I am poor and needy, but the Lord takes thought for me. Yes, you are my help and my deliverer. Do not delay, O oh my God. Would you pray with me this morning as we just, just invite God this morning to help us to see our desperate need for him? Father, as we begin to look at these prayers of confidence, Father, maybe the starting place for us this morning is not to continue with that self-reliant nature that is just so natural for so many of us. But maybe this morning, Father, God, would you help us to see our desperate need? There are things outside of ourselves that we just cannot do on our own. There are struggles within ourselves that we can't handle on our own. And God, may that May that realization this morning drive us closer to you. May it help us to know that we are in desperate need of you. And through that desperation, Father, may we come to learn that we can have confidence because it doesn't rely on us, Father, but it relies on you. It's not about just doing more, being better, Father, this morning, but it's about coming to you and trusting you to do all those things, God, that we desperately need, but are incapable of doing for ourselves. God, that, may that be our heart this morning. We love you. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Philip Keller wrote a book on Psalm 23. As I told you earlier, there are hundreds and hundreds of books written just on Psalm 23, but he wrote a book that became pretty famous. I think they've, it's sold over 2,000 copies, and it's called A, Shepherd's, a Shepherd Looks at Psalm 23. Philip Keller was a, uh, for one period of his life, was a shepherd out, uh, out in, in, in um, I believe it was, was it the Middle East, Africa, um, somewhere, somewhere out there, right? And he was, he was a shepherd. And so as he just experienced what it was like to actually be a shepherd, he's now reflecting on Psalm 23. And one of the observations he points out very early on in the book, and I think this is important, is that Psalm 23 is written from the vantage point of the sheep, not the shepherd, right? So keep that in mind. As Psalm 23, as we read this, David is writing this not as he was a shepherd, even though we know that he was a shepherd, he tended his father's flocks, but he's writing it from the perspective of the sheep. And that's what I want to invite you into with me this morning, is to look at Psalm 23 through the sheep's perspective. Through the sheep's perspective, and what it's going to allow us to do is to, to hopefully see our good shepherd in a new light this morning. And to see ourselves as we relate to him and the desperation that we need him for in our lives. And so I know Chloe read that for us this morning, but I'm going to read it for us one more time. I'm just going to read uh, the first three verses, which is where we'll be at today. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want 
He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. You see, we've been looking at these four aspects of prayer. If you guys remember, we've been looking at the up, down, in, and out, right? Up is the reverence. What do we, what do we know? What do we learn about God through this psalm? The down is what is our response based on who God is? What we learn about God, what is our response? The inward part is our request. What are those needs that we have? What are those, those relational needs that we have? What are those resource needs that we have? And then the out part of that is our readiness. Then knowing who God is, knowing what our response to him, laying our request before him. Now, how is God going to prepare us to go out into the world? So today we're just going to focus on that first part, the up, the reverence part. What do we learn about God from this passage? And I think these first three verses illustrate beautifully so many things that we need to come to understand about who God is. And first among those, and this is where David begins the psalm, first we have to realize that we belong to him. He is our shepherd, right? We're not our own shepherd. We don't belong to ourselves, but we actually belong to God. It starts out by saying, the Lord is my shepherd. That word Lord, when you see the word Lord in all caps in your Bible, it is the Hebrew word Yahweh. It is the personal name that God gave to his people to know him. Not just to know about God as this distant kind of deity, but a personal relational name that God gave to his people. You see, there's, there's, there's a couple of different uh, words in the Hebrew language to use for God. One of those is, is Elohim, and that's just the very uh, basic name for God or a deity or a spiritual being, right? But what David refers to here is not just that, that general name for God, but the specific personal name for God. And the place that, that many times we go back to, to, to in relation to this name Yahweh is that moment with Moses in Genesis chapter 3 when he's standing before the burning bush. You guys remember that story? Moses, right? He's, he's kind of exiled himself because of, he had committed murder. And so now he's, he's, he's living, tending flocks again, much like David, right? And he goes out into the field one day and he sees this, this bush that's on fire but not consumed by the fire, right? And the bush starts to speak to him out of this bush. And God calls him to go to Pharaoh, the most powerful person in the nation, and to, to tell him to release God's people to set them free. And in that moment, right, Moses does something really interesting. He does something really interesting. And I think it's something that we do sometimes as well. Have you ever been in a situation where you have forgotten somebody's name? Like you've met the person before, but you just, in that moment, you cannot think of the person's name. You guys ever done that? You ever been there, right? I'll give you one little trick for free, okay? This is something that works beautifully. I've used it so many times um, in those situations, right? If you're ever in one of those situations and you can't remember what someone's name is, right? If you have somebody else there with you, one of the simplest ways to do it is just to introduce that person, right? So uh, let's say, for example, that, you know, here's the person, you don't know their name. And, and let's say that you have Jim who's with you and you just say, hey, I'd like to introduce you to Jim. And then you just pause, and typically what happens is that other person then will introduce themselves, giving you a clue to who they really are. You see, I think that's what happens in this moment with Moses. Because what's interesting is that this name Yahweh, this word Yahweh is not the first time that it shows up in the biblical story. In fact, if we go all the way back to Genesis chapter 2 verse 4, it's the first place that we see this title given for God, Yahweh. But something happened over the course of the time from the, from the creation of the world to this moment in Exodus chapter 3 that God's people had forgotten his name. Maybe it was the captivity in Babylon and the captivity in, in Egypt. Maybe it was those, those years that they were held captive, but something along the way they had forgotten the name of God. And I wonder, I wonder this morning if we've forgotten something about God. Yeah, we, maybe we pray, maybe we say a prayer before we eat our meals. 
Maybe we read our Bibles on occasion or come to church on a Sunday morning. But I wonder if we have forgotten that our shepherd is the Lord, Yahweh, the personal name. God wants to have a personal relationship with his people. And I wonder this morning if part of the reason we don't have more confidence in God is we have forgotten. We've forgotten who he is. And so David reminds his readers, he says, the Lord, Yahweh, he is my shepherd. Shepherd. Now it's interesting, right? It's interesting that he would use that title shepherd to refer to God, right? Which begs the question this morning, who is this shepherd? Who is the shepherd? And if we trace throughout scripture, what we're going to come to understand is the shepherd that, that, that David is writing about in Psalm 23 is Jesus. Look with me at John chapter 10, verse 11. In the Gospels, here's what Jesus says. He says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Hebrews 13, verse 20 Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant. 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 4, And when the chief shepherd appears, speaking of Jesus, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. And so as we read this psalm, we have to read it understanding that he's talking about Jesus. And I can't think of a more personal way to connect with God than through the person of Jesus. God, Emmanuel, wrapped in flesh, who came to live this life in the same way that we live it, going through all of the heartaches and the pains and the struggles of life as an example for us, as a substitute for us. That's who David is inviting us in to understand. And I think when we understand the person and character of Jesus, it's going to help grow our confidence. Notice also, he doesn't just say that Jesus is a shepherd or some shepherd. He says, the Lord is my shepherd. And I think sometimes because we are so familiar with this passage, we can just kind of skip over the depth that's happening here. But what David is doing is he is tethering the God of this universe with his creation in this most intimate, personal way imaginable. He says, the Lord is my shepherd. Again, if we go back to this reference about sheep, Jerry, uh, Larry Richards, um, in his book, God as the Shepherd, says this. He says, in the Middle East, sheep were precious symbols of wealth. Their wool, their wool provided yarn for clothing and their bodies were preferred for sacrifice. However, sheep cannot survive alone in the wilderness, but must always be in the company of a shepherd. The Middle Eastern shepherd loved his sheep. He would love them so much he would name his sheep and he would care for them tenderly. Many of the shepherds would interpose himself between the wild beast and the sheep. And at night, the shepherd would lay down and slept in a single doorway to the sheepfold so that any enemy would have to pass through them in order to attack their flock. This is the, this is the imagery that David is trying to paint for us, right? I'm sure David, as, as, as a young boy who took care of his father's sheep, spent many nights under the stars laying and sleeping in the, the, the opening to that sheep gate as a protection to the flock. And in the same way, that's what he's saying is that God, God in the same way wants to lay and protect us. He wants to be that barrier between evil and us. This is the picture of who God is through the person of Jesus. Danny Aiken points out that there's 17 personal pronouns found in these six verses. Think about that. This is not just a random psalm that was written, right, through a random observation, but this is a deeply personal psalm that was written through experience. And I wonder, 
I wonder if it has become personal for us in the same way. I love what Henry Blackaby says, thinking about sheep in the Old Testament, in the Bible. Here's what he says. According to Scripture, Henry Blackaby says, it is better to be a sheep than a lion. Think about that for a second. Now, most of us, if I I were to ask you the question, if you could choose one animal to be a sheep or a lion, right? Most of us are going to pick a lion, right? The king of the jungle, right? But Blackaby goes on to say that it is better to be a sheep according to the Bible because the sheep has a shepherd. The lion must depend on its own strength and cunning, but the sheep belongs to one who will lay down his very life for its safety. And I, and I wonder this morning, how many of us prefer to be a lion in our own life? How many of us prefer to be the ones who are the stopping point for everything that happens in our life? How many of us want to, to live our life and kind of uh, create our life in such a way that it all depends on us instead of being the sheep that the Bible calls us to be where we can trust that our good shepherd is taking care of our needs, that he is the one who is willing to lay down his life for our safety. And we see that in the person of Jesus. And so here's what I want to do for just a minute, okay? We're not going to get into groups this morning, but just right where you're sitting in your seat this morning, I want to just give you a minute just to, just to kind of think about this for a minute. Because we're about to go into the section where, where the sheep acknowledge the needs and the, the way that the shepherd has provided for their needs. <clears throat> what are the needs that you have that are maybe hard for you to ask God for? What are those things in your life that maybe you just feel like, you know what, I just need to figure these things out myself, right? Maybe it's not that you don't think that God can, or maybe it's not that you think that God doesn't care, but maybe you just feel like, you know what, this is just my burden to carry. I need to figure this out on my own. So many times we like to just put those things on our back and worry and worry and worry. But Psalm 23 invites us to lay those worries down at the feet of our shepherd, to let him handle those things. And so maybe let's just take a moment or two this morning, and maybe you just want to invite God into that space that you've just kind of been holding on to for yourself. Maybe you want to say something like this, Lord, today I need you in fill in the blank, whatever that is for you. I need this from you. Why? Because God says that he is our good shepherd. So let's take a minute or two. Let's think about that before we move on in this psalm to see what it is that the Good Shepherd has already provided for us. The Good Shepherd provides for his sheep. The end of verse 1 says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I shall not want. Think about that for just a second. The good shepherd is saying that he provides everything that we need so that there's not even a place for want in our life. Philip Keller in that book, uh, Shepherd's View on Psalm 23, says this. He says, Sheep do not just take care of themselves, as some might suppose, but they require more than any other class of livestock. Endless attention and meticulous care. Parents in the room? Can you relate with this, right? I think it sounds like a description of of parenting, right? Endless attention and meticulous care. He says, it is no accident that God has chosen to call us sheep. You see, we have a lot of needs, right? If we're honest, we're needy people. There are things that we can't handle on our own. So David is inviting us here to to look to the good shepherd and to say, you know what, I don't have to take care of all of those on my own because the shepherd can do that. I also love what David's doing here. I think there's a little hyperlink right here in this idea of not having want. I think what David is doing is he is is hyperlinking these words back to that moment in the garden in Genesis 3. You guys remember that moment? Adam and Eve at at the tree 
right? And as Eve looked at the tree, right, all of these thoughts started to flood her, her mind about what God did not give her, right? Remember the words of the serpent? God is just holding back because he knows that if you eat from this tree, you will be like him. Started to plant that idea that, you know what, God is not really the good shepherd. He's holding back some of the best for me. David is writing these words to fly in the face of that, to understand that, that in this moment, Jesus, the second Adam, came to give us more than we could ever have on our own. And true contentment, right, get this, true contentment does not consist of having as much as you want, but in having, but in lacking little. Let me say that one more time. True contentment consists not in how much you have, but in how little you lack. How many of us know people, maybe we've heard stories or maybe we know some celebrities who have tons and tons of things, but seems like there's no contentment, right? Here is the good shepherd. Jesus is saying that I'm going to give you everything that you need. Does it mean that you're going to be wealthy? It doesn't mean that you're rich, right? But it means that you're going to have the things that you truly need, that you will be lacking nothing. And this goes throughout the gospel story, this picture of God providing for his people. Psalm 18 verses 1 through 2 says this, I love you, Lord, oh my God, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield, the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. As I go through the the waves and the wind of life and I go through situations, I can hold on to God as my rock. In the Gospels, in Luke chapter 12, verses 30 through 32, it says this, For all the nations of the world seek after all of these other things, and your Father knows that you need them. But instead, seek His kingdom, and these things will be added to you. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. See, some of us have this idea that God is just waiting to see what He can snatch away and take away from us. But this picture of the good shepherd is one who wants to give his sheep everything that they need. Finally, Psalm 34 verses 8 through 10 says this, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Oh, fear the Lord, you saints, for those who fear him have no lack. The young lion suffers want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. So first of all, he takes care of my needs. Secondly, we see here that he gives us rest. David moves on. He says, he makes me lie down in green pastures. Notice the action here. It says that he makes me lie down in green pastures. God knows sometimes that we need to rest. And sometimes God needs to force that hand. He needs to make us rest because we don't do a good job of that on our own. I think David has a good perspective here, right? We always want to keep doing more. We always want to keep trying to get ahead. We always want to try to work harder. But the heart of the shepherd for his sheep knows that at a certain point, those sheep also need to rest. You see, if a shepherd were to drive his sheep too hard for too long, inevitably, he's going to lose some of his sheep. And so God, as the good shepherd, recognizes that we need to lie down in these green pastures, that we need to have moments of rest. Because it not only replenishes our energy, but it also replenishes our heart and our soul. It's interesting, though, when when we think about sheep, there's a few reasons that sheep won't lay down and rest. First of those reasons is that when they are anxious, If they're worried about predators or other things, the sheep won't lay down and rest the way it needs to. Secondly is if they have conflict with other sheep in the fold, they won't lay down and rest. Number three is if they suffer from pests. If there's just these annoyances of pests that are invading them, they can't lay down and rest. Number four, they don't rest if they're in search of food. And David is saying, you know what? Because I have no needs, because my good shepherd takes care of those things, I can now lay down. He draws this parallel between a sheep and us. And we've all probably all been at that point in our life 
where we haven't been able to rest because there's been some sort of conflict in our life, right? Maybe it's been a relational conflict between you and someone else, and you just can't rest because that thing is always on your mind. And what David is telling us here is that, that God's desire for us, God's want for us, is to be free of those things. And the way that we do that, as he's going to say, is that we have to trust our shepherd. And so maybe this morning, maybe someone in this room this morning, maybe some of us in this room are walking around in the midst of a conflict and you just can't find rest. Maybe some of us are walking around with a chip on our shoulder because someone has hurt us or there's an annoyance or an expectation that was not met. And David invites us to take rest in the company of the good shepherd, to bring all of those things before our heavenly father and to trust that he can give us rest. You see, because rest is so important. But many of us, even though we know that we should rest, even though we know it's to our benefit, we continue just to push ahead. Marcia um, Horncock wrote um, a, a poem she called Psalm 23 Antithesis. And I want to read this for you this morning. And I want you to think about if this describes your life. So she wrote this to mirror Psalm 23. Here's what she said. She said, the clock is my dictator. I shall not rest. It makes me lie down only when exhausted. It leads me into deep depression. It hounds my soul. It leads me in circles of frenzy for activity's sake. Even though I run frantically from task to task, I will never get it all done. For my ideal is with me. Deadlines and my needs for approval, they drive me. They demand performance from me beyond the limits of my schedule. They anoint my head with migraines. That's my favorite line. My in-basket overflows. Surely fatigue and time pressures shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the bonds of frustration forever. You ever been there? You ever feel like that? You ever feel like you just can't get ahead? There's just always that next thing? I wonder what it would look like this week if we just said, you know what? My good shepherd, who actually knows more than I do, says that I need to rest. And so maybe I just need to start to trust him about a few of these things. And yeah, there may be things in my inbox and there may be some pressures that I don't get to, but I believe that my good shepherd knows better than I do. He promises to meet our needs. He promises to give us rest. We're going to move pretty quickly through these next few. He is my satisfaction. It says that he leads me beside the still waters. It takes a tremendous amount of work on the shepherd's behalf in order to find an appropriate water supply in the desert for the sheep. Not only that, but sheep will drink from any polluted source of water. And you guys can only imagine what happens if a sheep will drink from polluted water supplies, right? It won't take long until that sheep is sick or dead. I, this was personal for me. We used to have this dog, right? And I love this dog. He was awesome. He was a great dog, but this dog had one problem. If you let this dog outside and there was any standing water anywhere, he thought that it was just some sort of free reward for him and he would just drink it all, right? And not only that, but then two days later, you can imagine what the results of drinking that stagnant, nasty water was. And it was just a mess for like three or four days, right? And so every time we, went, we weren't able to let our dog just kind of roam freely in our backyard, we always had to watch where he went because every time he would drink this polluted water in the same way. David is drawing this, this picture of a sheep is that, that God provides these living waters for us, but yet we always tend to want to go back to these polluted sources. Jeremiah chapter 2 verse 13 tells us this. God speaking through Jeremiah the prophet says, For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living water, and they have hewn out cisterns for themselves, places for water, broken cisterns that can hold no water. You see, God is on offer offering us spiritual living water. And so many times we continue to just go back to those polluted sources, trying to find life in other things other than God, whether it's our own ability, whether it's through our finances, whether it's through relationships, all of these broken sources that can never lead to the true fulfilling waters of life. St. Augustine said it well, famously, when he said, O oh God, thou hast create, made us for thyself, and our souls are restless, searching till they find their rest in 
thee. You see, as human beings, we try to find these imitation sources of water. And yeah, they may meet our need in the moment, but ultimately, just like that dog who was going and drinking that stagnant water, they lead us in a worse condition than we were before. You see, Jesus, as our good shepherd, has an offer for us living water. Listen to what Jesus said to a woman, a Samaritan woman outside of a well in John chapter 4. He says this, Everyone who drinks this water from this well will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water that I shall give them will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. One of the interesting points that Keller, Philip Keller in, in, in his book, uh, Psalm 23, through the shepherds, looking at Psalm 23 as a shepherd, one of the things that he says in there, uh, one of the ideas that he puts out there is what this uh, still waters could mean is he said it could be a reference to the dew in the morning that would land on the grass and the sheep would be able to, 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 to get water, a water source, even out in the desert, out into a dry place from the dew that would be on the grass on the place they were feeding in the mornings. And I love that idea because it reminds me of God's nature. You see, oftentimes God doesn't give us everything we, everything that we're going to need in one moment, right? But it's a daily giving us our needs, a daily meeting our needs so we continue to be dependent on him. I love that. I love that picture that each morning God is giving us what we need. Each morning as we go to the well that does not run dry, the well of eternal life, that we continue to trust God to give us all the things that we need. He moves on, David moves on, he says, not only that, but he steadies my feet. He says he restores my soul. Soul. That word soul in the Hebrew is the Hebrew word nefesh. And it means, it literally means our life or our soul. It has the picture of a, of a throat, right? And this idea of just a, a dry throat and, and the idea of just water that just nourishes our soul. Um, and this is the picture here that he's picturing, right? Again, back to the shepherd language, um, oftentimes there's a condition called the, uh, that a shepherd referred to as a sheep getting cast down, getting cast down. It was this, it was this painful situation where a sheep would become helplessly stuck on its back and would ultimately die without any intervention. And this is the idea here that, that, G, that, um, that David has when he says that he restores my soul. You see, a lot of people would assume that when a, when a sheep was cast down, right, or in the reference to us when we are in apathy or sin, that the good shepherd would grow frustrated and resent the, the animal. But this is not the response of the good shepherd. The good shepherd comes and gently restores that sheep to its proper footing. Now, it's interesting um, when you research why this happens, right? How would a sheep get stuck on its back, right? I mean, can you guys imagine for a second if you were out somewhere and you see a pasture of sheep and you just see this giant sheep just stuck on its back, right? Can you just imagine how weird that would look? And at some point you would have to ask the question, how did that sheep end up in that situation, right? Now, now as a, as, a, as a dad with a bunch of boys, I find myself in that situation a lot. I'm like, how did you end up in that situation, right? So what would happen is that oftentimes if a sheep would find a low spot or a dip in the land, right, they would just kind of nestle down in there. And over the course of time, as they got comfortable kind of laying down, um, their center of gravity would, would shift and they would get stuck on their backs, and I think this is a beautiful picture here. How many times in our life does our comfort or searching for our comfort cause us to end up in a position of being cast down, helpless? We pursue so hard after our own comfort that sometimes the good shepherd has to come and he has to move us out of that comfortable situation for our own well-being. And what does it say? It says that he restores their soul, that he puts them back on proper footing. And I, I think, I think for a lot of us this morning, that comfort can be the great enemy to the spiritual life. I think comfort can go hand in hand with our spiritual apathy as followers of Jesus. In fact, oftentimes it's not new Christians 
who are at the most risk of apathy, but seasoned Christians who've been following Jesus for a long time, who've gotten comfortable in those Christian ruts, and before they know it, they're cast down, they're stuck, they're helpless in their apathy. And so I want us to take a few minutes together this morning, and we're going to have a, just, a, just a short discussion about this. So here's the question that we're going to talk about this morning. How have you seen comfort or the pursuit of comfort cause you to become stuck in your life or your relationship with God? What areas in your life do you need to be pushed out from comfort? Okay. Uh, the kids, uh, kids, we're going to meet in the back when Nicole and I, and we're going to talk to you guys about the same idea. So if you guys just want to get in groups, um, you know, maybe five or six people that are sitting close to you, let's talk about this. And then we're going to come back and finish these last uh, two thoughts that David has from Psalm 23. So oh, he moves on, right? Not only that, but he, he leads me, right? It says that he leads me in paths of righteousness. He leads us into safe places. Not safe in the way that we think of, but safe for our heart and for our soul. The best way to keep a sheep safe. That was a tongue twister. The best way to keep a sheep safe was to keep them moving oftentimes, right? It would keep them safe from the predators if they didn't stop too many times, but they continued on the path, leading them to the place that they needed to go. But sometimes selfish behaviors, right, for the sheep, maybe it was overgrazing or laziness, could lead them into danger. And so inevitably, while on the path, the sheep would wander off from the safety of the shepherd, Right? And throughout Scripture, this, is, this idea is spoken about us. Isaiah 53, verse 6 says, All we like a sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him, on him, Jesus, the iniquity of us all because we turned away from the heart of God, right? He had to put all of that on Jesus, his son. Proverbs 14, verse 12 tells us that there's a way that seems right to man, but its end is the way of death. But Jesus, as he speaks to his sheep, says this in John 14, 6. Jesus said, but I am the way, the true way, the truth and the life. And no one comes to the Father but by me. Philip Keller said this. He said, the stubborn, self-willed, proud, self-sufficient sheep that persist in pursuing its old paths and grazing on its old polluted ground will end up a bag of bones in a ruined land. I love that. I love that picture, right? He's talking about us. If we continue to chase after these old things, these things that lead us away from the heart of God, we're going to end up in that path of destruction. Not only does he lead us in paths of righteousness, but he does this for a purpose, for his glorious cause, or as David says, for his name's sake. You see, God puts his reputation on the line. God tethers himself with our story. God has a purpose in the places that he's leading us. He doesn't lead us down these paths that are sometimes hard and difficult just so that we can uh, endure the pain, but it's for a purpose, It's for a glorious purpose that his name may be known. Psalm 106 verse 8 says, you have saved them. This is a a reference looking back on the Exodus story. It says, you have saved them for his name's sake, that he might make known his power. I love what John Piper says about this. He says, God is the beginning and God is the end of all my righteousness. The path of righteousness is his grace as it is his starting point. You see, he is the one who leads us into the path of righteousness. And it is his glory as its destination. He is leading us for his namesake. You see, the purpose, right? The purpose of our lives, the purpose of your life is to bring glory to God. And so when we follow God down the path of righteousness, we bring him the most glory. So let's bring it all home this morning as we look at the Good Shepherd. First of all, I want to ask you, what needs do you have? What things are you trying to to do on your own? And what needs do we need to go and trust the Good Shepherd with? Do you worry this morning about lacking something? Financial needs, social status, recognition, love, those things that you're looking for and can't find contentment in. 
Because the good shepherd comes to you and says, you shall not want. He takes care of your needs. Do you worry incessantly to the point of exhaustion? Are you tired and feel like you can't take another step? Do you feel the pressures of life just washing over you? Are you filled with conflict with other people or annoyances by other people? Do you walk around with a chip on your shoulder waiting to explode on the first person that comes in contact with you? The good shepherd says that he makes you lay down in green pastures. Do you find everything in life dissatisfying? He says that he will lead you by the still waters. Do you feel stuck in life? Do you feel like that cast down sheep who's laying on their back with no way to get up? Do you feel like your sin has pushed you to the point that there is no place of forgiveness? Or has your pursuit of comfort kept you from doing the things that you should do? This morning, I would invite you to come to the Good Shepherd because he restores your soul. Do you feel lost this morning? Like you're wandering through a path in life with no direction. This morning, I would invite you to come to the Good Shepherd who leads us on a path of righteousness for his purpose. Do you feel like you have to meet all of your needs this morning? I would invite you to come to the Good Shepherd because we belong to him. I want to end with this last illustration. Um, in, back in uh, ancient, uh, or back in, um, back in the day, I guess as you would say it, in the Middle East, uh, a shepherd, right, when they wanted to, uh, when they got a new sheep, they would, there was this process, right? There was this process in which they would mark that sheep as belonging to them. They would put a distinctive mark on their ear. And the process they would do this is they would take a very sharp knife and they would cut a notch out of that sheep's ear, right? In order to indicate that that sheep belonged to that shepherd so that if it wandered off into another flock, they would be able to identify that with their sheep. Today, we have things like ear tags and stuff that, able, that will enable us to, to know our livestock or microchipping like we put on some of our pets, right? But in, but in this day and time, they would put a notch, take a notch out of the ear. I love what Philip Keller said about this. He says, there would be pain for both the sheep and the shepherd, as the shepherd had to inflict some pain on the sheep in order to notch this out. But from our mutual suffering, he said, an indelible lifelong mark of ownership would be made that could never be erased. And from then on, every sheep that came into that shepherd's possession would bear his mark. See, the question this morning is, do we bear the mark of our shepherd? Do we belong to him? Or are we just some sheep trying to go on our own, right? That's the picture. You see, we, we started this morning by talking about psalms of confidence. And as a sheep, the only way that we can have confidence is to know that we have a good shepherd. And the only way that we can know that we have a good shepherd is that we belong to him, right? And there's pain that comes along with that sometimes, right? Many of us can probably share stories of the pains that we've had to go through in life, the things that we've had to walk through in order to see our brokenness and our need for that shepherd. But what I love about this story, what I love about this psalm is that it's a reminder that God doesn't waste the pain that it took to come to him. God doesn't waste that brokenness and the hurt that we've experienced along the way, but God redeems all of that. And now those of us that belong to him walk with a mark of our good shepherd so that we belong to him, that we can be recognized as him and that we can find freedom and fulfillment in him. And so I would invite you this morning. Maybe you're, maybe you're one of those sheep this morning that has just kind of wandered off the path. Maybe it's comfort and you're just kind of stuck in your relationship with God. Maybe it's the worries and the anxieties and you're just frozen right where you're at. I think no matter where you find yourself this morning, the invitation is universal, that we would come to our good shepherd, that we would trust in him, and that then we could have confidence knowing that it's not about us doing more or being more, but our confidence comes to us admitting that we are needy people 
and that he is the good shepherd. Pray with me this morning as our worship team uh, comes up to lead us in this last song of response. Father, we just want to ask this morning that you would just make us aware of the trillions of ways that we are needy. And God, grant us the humility this morning to acknowledge those needs as we start to walk back on the path following after you. God, as sometimes that's going to look like us maybe this week doing some things that we haven't done in a while. It's going to be uncomfortable. Creating new patterns and new routines in our life this week all for the purpose of coming to know you, to know that we can have confidence. God, as we come to you and as we ask and as we have needs in our life, that we can have confidence that you will meet those needs, Father, because you are the good shepherd. And God, may our lives be a mark of glory for you. In the places that we go and the things that we do, God, may you receive the glory for that. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.